I'm sorry, I can't hear you over the wonderful sounds of nature. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 240. It is July 9th, 2020. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, as always, we have so much to talk about this week. And so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and only wrestling podcast. That's right. So if you're new to the show, we're trying to throw it up on every possible platform known to man. We got a YouTube channel set up uh, last week here in the year of our Lord, 2020. And we are looking for subscribers there. Uh, you can't monetize YouTube until you get to a thousand subscribers. So this is obviously a very long term play. <laughs> but please uh, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell your enemies. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's TWL underscore podcast. That's also the Twitter handle where you can find Liam at TWL underscore podcast. And you can find my stuff at WrestlingObserver.com. And I just wanted to take a moment here to put over and shout out my good, dear, close, personal friend, uh, the lead editor at WrestlingObserver.com, Joseph Courier. Joe is a great guy with a tremendous work ethic. I don't know what he gets paid, but he's severely underpaid. He works uh, seven days a week around the clock uh, putting up content at WrestlingObserver.com. And uh, and he checked out the show last week. So, uh, hey, Joe. Thanks, Joe. And when this is all over, I think you and I should get an apartment together. Well, that took a turn. All right, so a uh, big Wednesday Night War stuff this week. Night two of the Great American Bash. Night two of the EW Fighter Fest. We're recording shortly after those shows concluded. I cover AEW Fighter Fest, so I did not get a chance to see the Great American Bash, but I'm aware that Keith Lee is now a double champion. And Liam, I believe you sampled some of both shows. Uh, just big picture, what did you think of the Wednesday Night War this week? Yeah, I thought both shows were very, very good from what I watched. Um, no... Uh... No losers in the the war, singular, uh, this week. I thought both shows at least had something good or built to something going forward in almost every segment on both shows. Uh, and then you had you capped it off with uh, you know, really entertaining main events, different types and different styles of main event matches. But um, yeah, up and down the show, uh, a lot of good wrestling on both shows and. Uh, set up some stuff for the next couple of weeks of television as well. And that's really all you can ask. Sure. So AEW is coming back with their fight for the fallen show, uh, airing in the dynamite time slot next week. They their hand was kind of forced, uh, with John Moxley having to quarantine. Uh, so they pushed the, their world title match to next week. A couple other matches announced for that show, but that's the big one. Cody defending a TNT title against Sonny Kiss. And uh, Lucha Brothers against FTR, which is just going to be insane if tonight's eight-man tag <laughs> was was uh, a harbinger of things to come. Just, I, I mean, I think that's my favorite match uh, on Dynamite. I don't know. At least in the quarantine era, I maybe ever. That eight-man tag tonight was crazy yeah that was uh that was awesome that's like everything great about that style of wrestling it was just non-stop action incredible athleticism and eight really talented guys just you know just leaving it all out there and uh yeah it was it was awesome <laughs> phoenix and nick jackson especially uh but everybody in the match is really good so uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I ha the, the butcher and the blade are still the team I know the least because I never really watched either of them prior to them coming to AEW. But they, I mean, they fit right in with all of these, you know, expertly talented tag team wrestlers. They did not look out of place in the least. So, yeah, everybody looked great. 
Yep, and uh, Omega and Paige kept the tag titles in the opener of a private party. I didn't expect a title change there, <laughs> especially since they closed last week's show with a face-off between FTR and the tag champs. But uh, also there was no follow-up <laughs> on that this week, which is just... Sometimes I wonder if anyone there knows what they're doing, but... <laughs> Well, I don't know. It's sometimes it seems like they do, <laughs> but uh, yeah, when something like that happens, we talked about it a little bit last week. But shooting that angle and where you don't really even mention private party, even though they're the next in line for the shot, and then the following week you have all of those guys on the show, but they don't cross paths this week, and then you have the Lucha Bros pin. I guess they pin the Matt Jackson, not one of FTR, but. <laughs> Right. To set up the Lucha Bros versus FTR for the following week. It's like, well, not quite sure why we needed to do the face-off between the tag champs and FTR. Again, I think I talked about it last week. You could have just, if you just want to bring out all the tag teams and do like a big brawl or whatever, I'm fine with that. But they specifically focused in on FTR and Hangman and, and Kenny with right. the Bucks kind of hanging around. So. Right. And but now it seems like it's FTR and Lucha Bros with maybe the winner getting a tag title shot there. But I don't know. They're <laughs> they've uh seems like the story has been told a little bit out of order is all. Yes. Yes, I think that's fair criticism. Uh so NXT is answering next week with the women's title match between Tegan Knox and Io Shirai. Um feels early to take the title from Io, but They've been high on Tegan for a long time, and I don't know if having her lose in her first uh, her first shot is the way to go, but I guess we'll find out. I mean, my thought is if if in fact they think Kyrie is done soon, yeah. I could see them wanting to give Asuka a new partner, and they've already sort of teased that on NXT last week. Um, and so I could see them wanting to move EO up into that role and having Tegan be the champion. Um, because I think I feel like it's like it's one of those things like Jeff Hardy winning the money in the bank that year where nobody ever comes out and says it. But I feel like Tegan was definitely gonna win that May Young Classic where she got hurt. Right. And when that didn't happen, everything was kind of put on hold. But it seems like that sort of she's definitely one of their long term projects and I don't think it would be a terrible move to just have her win and, and have EO move on. Cause I don't, don't know how many fresh, fresh programs there are for EO and NXT at this point. That's uh that's an idea I hadn't considered. And there is kind of the Bill Watts rule there of, Oh, there's two Japanese women. They must either feud or team together. So. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, that role very much still exists in uh, in certain wrestling promotions. <laughs> sure. Um, big week for Keith Lee. He unified the uh, North American and NXT championships. I guess it's not a unification, but he now holds both titles. Yeah, uh, I was a little surprised just because they had seemingly started to set up Karrion Cross for Adam Cole prior to... Uh, announcing this unification match. So I kind of expected Cole to win here and then drop the belts to him, but they went a different direction. And Hey, like I've been, uh, you know, complaining for two years that triple H has had like the best dude in any company in Keith Lee. And he was doing nothing with him for the first 18 months he was there. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to complain that they finally figured out that Keith Lee is great. And should be should be their top guy, but uh, yeah, I, I was I was a little surprised by it just because of that. But yeah, I think Keith Lee is is a guy you build your company around. So I'm I'm certainly not not upset at that either. Do you get the sense it's a long term play, or do you think it's um more of a reactionary? short-term move considering things that are going on in American culture today? Um, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't trust WWE to ever do anything like that for the right reasons. So sure. I could, yes, 
there there that could be sort of a cynical PR ish move based on the very, very small amount of African American world heavyweight champions they've had in their uh the company's long history. Um maybe, but like I said, I just think <laughs> I think he's the best guy there all around, so the best the champion, so Hopefully, I mean, there is that thing where, uh, regardless of uh, of race, uh, you're, if you're a babyface in a Triple H booked promotion, your title reign is usually pretty short. So I I don't know if he's if he's holding both of those belts for too long, but uh, hopefully he at least gets a ring with for a little bit with the world title. Yeah, I wasn't sure about the move with uh, Cole showing the sign of respect to uh, Keith Lee either. There it felt. Very out of character for the Adam Cole character, but what do I know? Yeah, that's that's a little weird. Again, unless unless he's leaving or unless like he's going to go face and the rest of the Undisputed Era is going to turn on him, which doesn't seem like a great idea to me. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 pretty. <laughs> that's that screams like we wanted a photo op or or we wanted uh we want something for a video package. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we mentioned uh, Kyrie Sane a lot last week, talking about the report that she was possibly retiring, probably leaving WWE, going back to Japan to be with her husband. Where she, I mean, she just got married within the last year. Her husband lives in Japan, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Kyrie Sane was on Raw on Monday. And Kyrie Sane and Oscar are getting a shot at the women's tag titles on Raw this coming Monday. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, I I was unclear when this report uh, came out whether they meant like she's done now, which right. obviously she isn't because she's back, but or if it was more meant to me like whenever her current deal is up in the next year or so, then she's gone. Um. And I guess it's the latter. Yeah. Okay, so she's, at least for the short term, and I guess that was also part of the report, was there was an idea that somebody was going to beat her up and quote-unquote end her career in case she wasn't coming back. Right. And then Asuka would go for revenge. I'm guessing that person was going to be Shayna Baszler before she uh, <laughs> mis- mysteriously disappeared from, from WWE television. Yeah. Yeah, that's another report worth, worth worth discussing. So Vince, the report in the Wrestling Observer last week is that Vince pulled Shayna Baszler from TV because he didn't get her. Shock. Which, which we knew after week two of the Shayna Baszler push. So if you remember week one, she was a vampire. Right. And then week <laughs> two, uh, Becky was laughing her off. <laughs> Yes, and then they still kind of half-heartedly went ahead with making her a monster, but then Becky beat her and then vacated the belt. So, yeah, if her her last her last thing on the main roster was saying that kid's gonna suck, look who the <laughs> father is, and then walking <laughs> off the best the best promo she ever cut, and then uh, and then she's just she's just never on TV. Apparently, she's gonna be on main event soon. That's her. <laughs> Belair like they have her and Bianca Belair two women that again I really think you could like build a division around and they're both out on a show with them Liv Morgan like a lot of people that haven't been on television for like God bless Natalia but nothing she can do she's in that Miz and Ziggler category for me whereas you have people like Bianca and Shayna and Liv Morgan just hanging event yeah, it's not not ideal. It's not ideal. You know, Liv Morgan's better than she has any right to be, given her level of experience and the lack of time she gets to wrestle. Yeah, yeah, I think she's she's pretty good. Like, yeah, they've put her in. I mean, they they generally keep them relatively short, but they've put her in singles matches on Raw with Charlotte and other bigger names and she's looked perfectly fine in the ring so it's not as if she's she's like some divas era terrible worker it's not like she's lana out there right she's not lana or billy k um 
Ruby Ruby Riot's also done pretty much nothing since she's been back. So, like, I, it's it's not as though the division is so strong right now that they can afford to not do anything with any of these people. <laughs> right. It's not like you have, you know, Ibushi and Okada and Naito on top, and so Ishii gets lost in the shuffle. It's like, <laughs> it's like we have Nakanishi and like other old people that have been around forever just sitting on top and we have like young interesting people just kind of hanging out on the bottom of the card <laughs> and bailey and sasha have to work every show <laughs> that's right we have no over. other heels right <laughs> they're the only heels for all three brands right it's it's kind of insane uh alexa and nikki kind of <laughs> Fit fit there too. Uh, they uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's really weird. Uh, the unexpected star on Monday Night Raw this week was Heath Slater. <laughs> he was great. He was great. I didn't like because I never like when he started talking about how he's got he's got two daughters. Not like the fake gimmick he played on TV where he had like twenty kids. That right. irritated me because you know. <laughs> You know, everyone, if you've listened to the show, in case you're a newer listener, uh, shoot promos are terrible and I hate them and they're never good. Even the good ones are bad. And um, so I didn't need that part of it. But he just got this promo about how Drew, how he was always there for Drew and Drew got fired years ago. He was always there for him. But when, when he again, it's also one of those things kind of like the Drake Maverick thing where like unless you're rehiring Heath doing this and then just shoving him off into unemployment, weird and bad yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because he came out and talked about what a jerk drew is who didn't call him after he got released and drew didn't try to like contest that point in any way. So I'm guessing in storyline, that's true, <laughs> um, which kind of makes your top baby face seem like a jerk. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, Drew beat him in 10 seconds with a Claymore, and then they hug. <laughs> so. It's, it's, it's almost like they had a, a kernel of a good idea for a story. They just lack the ability to make it good completely. Now, I imagine had he not gotten hurt and needed another surgery that perhaps Jinder Mahal would be in Dolph Ziggler's spot right now. And Jinder bringing back Heath would make more sense, like, thematically. <laughs> right. Being right. that they were the three-man band. But instead, Dolph brought him out, and then, yeah, they <laughs> they had a 10-second wrestling match, and then and then Dolph beat up Heath, and Drew made the save, and then... I guess everything is all forgiven. <laughs> Heath, Heath forgave Drew for not calling him for three months uh, because <laughs> Drew saved him from getting beat up. Apparently. I would just prefer that we all pretend three-man band never happened. I don't think it does anybody a look good to bring that up. No, it doesn't. I mean, I maybe just make general allusions. Just speak in generalities, if you would. <laughs> sure, of course. Um, about how these three men were were one associated with each other. They were all probably in like WWE developmentals together at some point. Just say they came up together. Sure. Um, but thematically, it would have made more sense if the, if Ginger was in that role. But instead, yeah, they just brought out the as far as we all know, still fired Heath Slater to uh, to announce to uh, just announce that Drew McIntyre was a bad friend. <laughs> Yeah, that's certainly, certainly a direction. Uh, I guess there was a report that, no shock, that WWE wanted to run shows in front of people in Florida as soon as possible. But now, at very least through SummerSlam, they will not be doing that. So for the next, you know, six or seven weeks, they'll be still at the Performance Center. Uh, Florida, not one of the 15 states where coronavirus, coronavirus cases are still turning downward. We live in one of the states where things are actually going pretty well. Uh, not in my neighborhood specifically, uh, <laughs> where like eight restaurants have closed. 
felt like all within walking distance of my house mm-hmm. uh, because people had the virus. But uh, so WWE in the performance center, at least for the next six weeks or so, uh, the insane old guy is still going to run a show for first, right? I mean, it's just... I mean, I think he... Well, you remember like how much mileage they got in their own documentaries yes. of him, of the show after nine eleven. They they're and, not done talking about that yet, right? And how they healed the nation by having a wrestling show three days after nine eleven or whatever. Yes. Um. So that's exactly what it's what it's going to be like. They're going to do a big thing. They're going to have maybe they'll have Stephanie do that speech this time. Right. About the resiliency of the American spirit or whatever. But yeah, they're going to do that again. And they're going to replay it in a video package with emotional music for the next 15 years. I I don't hate the I actually think it's a really good idea to do like a big, you know, for la- call it homecoming or whatever, call whatever, throw a big first show back pretend like none of this stuff ever happened sure (laughs) like that's a really good idea you should make a really big deal of the first show but it just shouldn't be for like any time for the next six months or so or at least till there's a vaccine yeah ideally (laughs) especially not if you're operating in the state where they had ten thousand new cases in one day the other day Uh, maybe maybe don't try to run a show in that state uh, specifically yeah yeah the most um, passionate anti-mask states are the ones where things are just out of control. The entire state of Arizona, there's 150 ICU beds left in the entire state because so many people there have coronavirus. Yeah, that's weird. Because uh, you'd think all these giant liberal uh, hotbeds where there were the giant protests where everyone was wearing masks... Uh, you know, if we, you would think if, as, as we have been told, that masks don't work and are in fact harmful, as, as Loki informed us on Twitter recently, <laughs> that the masks actually harm you rather than protect you, uh, that, that, you know, New York and Los Angeles and Baltimore and, and Atlanta would all be having these huge spikes. But it's, it's weird. They're, they aren't having them. But the states where there weren't a lot of people wearing masks and where they opened things, everything up very quickly... They're all having spikes. That's weird. Yeah. Uh, New Japan will run their first shows with fans this weekend, although the virus is much closer to being under control everywhere else in the world besides the United States right now. Uh, and well, especially ma- comparatively, even like Italy and some of those places where it was really bad look all right compared to us now. Oh, yeah. I mean, every. Pretty much every place. I, I mean, I haven't looked at Mexico numbers because I know it was really bad there a couple of weeks ago. Mm. But yeah, aside from uh, us, things are pretty going pretty well all over the world. But New Japan's running two shows this weekend with like one third capacity of New Japan Cup final and uh, Dominion the next day. It's Okada and Evil in the New Japan Cup final. I did not have it those two in my final uh it's 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 a decision it's an interesting choice and then uh the winner of that challenges naito on uh sunday morning i'm assuming it's okada that is going to beat evil but evil has beaten okada before evil and naito would be a new match i don't have a good feeling for which way this is going to go uh what new japan have you seen lately uh anything stand out to you uh, did you love Okada and Hiromu as much as I did? Yeah, that was that was pretty spectacular. It was funny because the last week's show, I think I mentioned that I thought uh, MJF and Wardlow uh, <laughs> versus the Jurassic Express was maybe one of my favorite matches of the of the quarantine era. And then I watched that, and I, like Hiromu is great, great, great. He is one of the ten. I, you always like to say, and I like I like yeah. stealing your lines. Yeah, he's one of the ten best workers in the world. Kazuchika Okada is one of the three best workers in the world. Yeah. And you put those two guys together and just let them go nuts for a while. And it's just, wow, what a shock. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, that's and that's I mean that's my only thought. And not that I evil, my my thought is like the the finals of this tournament and perhaps the title match the next day. They got a lot to live up to because there were some darn good matches in this tournament. And I mean, having actual fans will probably help uh, help some of these matches as well. But uh, you know. <laughs> Evil, evil's got a got a full plate if he's gonna if he's gonna <laughs> kind of match that. And again, I like evil a lot. I just yeah, uh, you know, compared he he might be one of the you know fifty best wrestlers in the world, but he's right, not right. one of the ten best. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I thought for sure they were going to do Okada and Sonata again, <laughs> just, mm-hmm. be, just because it seems like they think that's a super rivalry. I I disagree, but. <laughs> Okada I mean, they... disagrees. He's, he's always like, he's like, they want him to be my rival, but I keep beating him. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you do, man. <laughs> I mean, Sonata did finally beat him once, but anyway, I mean, they have they have good matches. I just, I'm just I'm just tired of seeing it. Like, I'm anyway. tired of seeing him let go of the skull end and go for that goddamn moon salt. Yes, yes, he did it again. He does it in every match. Like at some point, you have to address this. That's the thing is like the New Japan commentary team is like one of my favorite commentary teams in right. maybe ever. Like yeah. I think everybody plays their role really well. Rocky's a great color guy. Gino's a great color guy. Uh, uh, Kevin Kelly and Chris are both really good as well in, in their respective roles. But like in every single high profile match, there's the spot where he has the skull end locked in and then he just lets go of it. When he has the, like the body scissors and everything, and just goes for that damn moon salt, and it drives me nuts. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Someone has to address this at some point, but uh, we don't have to worry about that in the uh, the New Japan Cup Finals uh, this weekend. Uh, Sho and Shingo are wrestling for the Never Title. They had a banger uh, in the New Japan Cup, so they will run that back on Sunday at Dominion. And uh, the tag titles, uh, Ibushi and Tanahashi defending against Saber and Taichi. So there's that as well. Do you get the feeling that Show's getting primed to like strike out on his own soon? I don't. I don't know. Like I, I, I had that feeling more like I don't know, eighteen months ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it seems like they kind of. I don't know if they got. I don't know that they got mad at him for something. But I just had the impression that maybe they thought he had gotten a little, he had gotten a big head, and they had, they had kind of depushed him a little bit. And they don't have TNA to send send those guys to anymore when they want to punish them, <laughs> and teach right. them humility. <laughs> right, right. So the, I mean, anyway, they put the focus more back on showing Yo as a team. Well, now Yo's down with a knee injury, so I don't know if this is more. Um, yeah, if this show singles push right now is more just a matter of circumstance with Yo being out and mm-hmm. Sho and Shingo being a good match, or if, yeah, they're really, you know, getting ready to do something with him. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it, it's it's weird. He, he's a weird case in that he's great, but mm-hmm. they they still look at they are only going to go so far with a junior heavyweight and he's, you know, five foot seven or whatever. And maybe he can bulk up and be, you know, 185 or 190 or whatever. By the way, it's fake. You can say he's 200 pounds or 200, <laughs> 220 pounds or whatever your heavyweight. I was going to say NXT did a tale of the tape tonight where they claimed Adam Cole was six foot and 210 pounds. I almost, <laughs> I almost laughed myself into a coma. You can just say whatever you want. <laughs> Nobody cares. Right. But they still, they still, I, I just don't think, I don't see show getting the, a heavyweight push there. Just he's, he's small. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always going to, even I mean we've talked about that for years with Ishii, which is as great as he is, and he's bigger than Sho, yeah. and but he's still you know relatively sh- you know pretty he's pretty short and he, yeah I could see Sho if he ever goes heavyweight being in that Ishii type role where 
you know, once every 18 months or so, he'll work his way into a title match or an intercontinental <laughs> title match here or there. And he can wrestle for the never belt. But yeah, I don't right. I don't see him ever being pushed at like a sustained push at a at a high level. Right. I, I, I because you brought up Ishii, who's one of my favorite guys in the entire world. <sighs> it is such a tragedy that he's never gonna get the IWGP heavyweight championship. And I get that they don't treat that as a lifetime achievement award or a participation trophy the way the WWE treats their championships sometimes. Mm-hmm. But but he is legitimately, on his worst day, one of the ten best guys in the world. <laughs> and, yes. And has been for a long time. And as you mentioned, is so good that every, he works himself he works his way into a world title match every year or 18 months or however long it is just by virtue of how great he is. And yet they will never go all the way with him and give him a title, which, you know, he's, you know, like 43 or 44 now or whatever. It's like time is time has passed, but that guy's so great. He's amazing. And, you know, it's funny. We've been talking a lot on AEW about uh, how Taz is. I I don't know if we talked about this on air, but Taz is like, similar size to Ishii. Yes. But very few people ever in like US professional wrestling have portrayed an angry badass better than Taz does. Yeah. And I always think that way about Ishii where it's like, yeah, there's the size thing, but it's like he can be in there with Okada, he can be in there with a junior heavyweight, uh he can be in there with Tai Chi, he can be in there <laughs> with any of these guys, Suzuki, Goto, any of these guys. Fale, like, and he will make, and he will somehow, he will work their style of match. He'll get them to work his style of match. Like somehow, he always pulls out like this incredible match, no matter what type of opponent he is. He like, he, if he's working with a high flyer, he knows how to be a base for them. If it's a brawl, he knows how. Obviously, he's a great brawler. Like he's just he's good at everything. Yeah, his regular tag partner is Toru Yano. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who's like a great comedy guy, and it's mm-hmm. like, and it works. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. All right, so uh, we've covered WWE, AEW, NXT, New Japan. Uh, is there anything else you want to get to this week? I don't think we need to go super long, unless there's anything else you want to get into. Uh, I just want to make a note that uh, Santana Garrett is a magician now. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> like? <laughs> Wait, I haven't. I haven't seen I haven't seen this or anything related to this. Please tell me she's dressed like Zatanna. Kind of, <laughs> uh, but it's like she's she's wearing pinstripes, but she has a she has a top hat and like a a putting on the Ritz cane, and she she comes to the ring, and uh, she has like a little cape, and uh, yeah, she's uh, apparently she's a magician now. She and <laughs> she she and the returning Mercedes Martinez had a match had a match of the of women who WWE could have hired at any point in their history, but waited until AEW was around to hire. All right. Santana Garrett is younger than I thought. I just had to Google her. Uh, she's only 32. I thought she was older for some reason, just because... Yeah, she's like Charlotte's age. <laughs> I think Charlotte might even be older than her. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to look that up right now, but Santana Garrett would have fit perfectly in the divas era and maybe there's still hope that she can get a little bit better now but i feel like that ship has sailed and it was really weird that wb signed her when they did but as you <laughs> pointed as you pointed out the timing yeah the timing that is there so you could say she's stealing uh anna jay's gimmick now right <laughs> yeah that's true because Anna Jay does the magician thing, and I believe when I believe Cody literally said, "Oh, she looks like Satana when she first debuted <laughs> on television." So that's right. We're uh, we've got dueling magicians here in this this wrestling war. We demand to be taken seriously. <sighs> uh, all right. Yeah, good point. Uh, hey, the uh, AEW Puppy Bowl was on YouTube uh, this week and not on uh, Dynamite. Um, but I almost had to cover it. So, 
You know, on, honestly, some weeks I'd rather cover a puppy bowl than dynamite. But not this week. This week is a good show. I mean, yeah. If, if the choice is that or, like, you know, Brody Lee versus versus Joey Janela or something, yeah, I can, I can see why the puppies have a little more appeal. Sure. All right. So, till next time, everybody, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. thinking about my favorite letterman joke maybe ever today (laughs) yeah um which is he was doing it's just like it's just from this random monologue in this random thing i found i was watching on youtube one day but he's he's talking about the most stolen car in america there was a survey done it's like the most stolen car in america was a you know a mustang or whatever right right and he says but you know what the least stolen car was the batmobile It's tremendous. <laughs> it's just this random joke in this random monologue that I stumbled across on YouTube. And I will never forget that joke. <laughs> the stolen car? The Batmobile. <laughs> yeah, he is, uh, he's greatly missed. <laughs> yeah, our, our off-air talk of Michael Keaton coming back uh, <laughs> refreshed that in my mind. Yeah, tremendous stuff. Tremendous stuff. Can't wait for old Batman, by the way. It's going to be great. All right, like, let him come back as old Batman and then wait a couple more years and he, he can be old Bruce in Batman Beyond movie. Like, just do that. Perfect. Like, yeah, great. Everybody, everybody wins. Right. You got to give the people what they want. Exactly. So what are we doing? Frasier Observer Radio. <laughs> Did you watch any Frasier this week? I certainly did. So, um, obviously, one of the big uh, story threads throughout the entire series. By the way, Frasier was on 11 seasons. <laughs> After how many seasons of Cheers before that? Like A similar number. Mm-hmm. May have been only been like eight years of Cheers or something like that, but... Did they like? Did he spin off before Cheers was over, or was like Cheers ended then Frasier started? Cheers ended then Frasier started. Okay. Uh, they might have done one of those like backdoor pilot episodes where one of the last episodes of Cheers mm-hmm. was like basically a Frasier pilot. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't recommend starting with season one of Frasier. Like, I know often it takes sitcoms a while to find their footing, but I mm-hmm. really. I really thought like season one of Frasier was really boring. <laughs> and then like somewhere in season two, they find they found out what worked. But uh, yeah, so uh, a thread throughout most of the thing is Niles is in love with Daphne. Um, Frasier's dad's live in home health care worker. And uh She doesn't know that he has a crush on her, and of course they're never both available at the same time, and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So working through a lot of uh, season six this week, (laughs) or maybe it's seven. It's seven. Uh, Like middle of season seven, Daphne finds out that Niles has had a thing for her for six years. (laughs) So, uh, and uh, hilarity ensues. So there you go. We'll have to, well, I can't wait to find out what happens. And of course, I'll never watch the show. So I will right. only find out if you tell me. So I'm, right. I'm, I'm hoping we come back next week for or next episode for another episode of Frasier Observer Radio. Well, so I can find out what happened on this 12 year old sitcom. Well, uh, the, last, the last episode aired in 2003, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> Even older year-olds. than that. But, uh, uh, so, spoiler alert, uh, Niles and Daphne get together in the end. Okay. Um, All right. Good to know. Uh, but, um, gosh, I was going to say. Oh, so, one of the, the, the other key thing, like, it, it's a delicate balance here throughout the whole series. Like, Frasier is pompous, and he's arrogant, and he's stuck up, 
and he's rich, and he has all these things going against, like, why you would not want to root for this character. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And yet they still have to find a way to make him somewhat uh, lovable because he's the title he's the title character of the series, right. and it's a very delicate line. But I think they managed to walk it pretty well. That's that's pretty good. Kelsey, Kelsey Grammer uh, is also in the soon to be Academy Award winning picture Money Plane yes. with Adam Copeland. That I I'm tempted to like find out where I can buy that and right. and watch it. And yeah. pretend it's for the show, but more just because <laughs> I want to hear Kelsey Grammer say the word money plane. <laughs> yes. It, how could it be bad? Right. It has the two key qualities of any great film. Kelsey Grammer <laughs> and the words money plane. <laughs> right. Uh, I also finally got around to watching the Marine Six this week. Ooh. Which I, I can't believe I forgot to bring this up on the show. But uh, would you like me to spoil the Marine Six for you? I guess. Uh, the Miz dies at the end. Oh, my. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. So no more Marine movies, at least with The Miz as the Marine. So so who are the, the heels in that movie? Is, is Shawn Michaels the heel? No, Miz and Shawn are baby faces. Becky is the lead heel. Oh. Does she die, too? Uh... Gonna be honest with you, the last half hour or so of the movie, I was chasing the dog around trying to get him to take his pills, and I'm a little fuzzy on some of the plot points. Okay, uh, well, we know for sure Miz is dead. Yes, there's a a water fight scene with Becky and Sean towards the end, and I think she may have drowned, but uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, is, at the end of this, is the implication that we'll follow old man Sean from here on out, or... This yeah, they the left... end of the saga. Well, they definitely left it open where you could see a Sean, a spinoff. Okay. Uh, Shawn Michaels, by the way, best actor in the movie by far. Woof. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the software, but you would think The Miz would be based on the fact that he's been in at least four movies. Three of them were Marine movies. <laughs> right. Right. No, no. Miz, I would say Miz and Becky Lynch were passable. Uh huh. Uh, Sean was actually good. Um, also, I went to see the Christian movie that Sean did a few years ago in the theater. Yes. <laughs> he was good in that. <laughs> and that, and that movie was shockingly good and surprisingly moving. Huh? I can't imagine, or I can't remember what the name of that movie is, but uh. Uh, better movie than the Marine 6. There were things they did with the Marine 6. There were choices they made, like trying to keep the plot very small. Uh-huh. It was, wasn't was like, you know, they were flying all over the world chasing secret agents or something. It was like, basically the entire plot of the movie is Sean and Miz have to get this hostage out of a building. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and that's a good 60, 65 minutes of the 90-minute movie. It's just them trying to get out of a building. That sounds like that could cross over with uh, 12 Rounds 4 starring Dean Ambrose. Because <laughs> I think that was the plot of that movie. <laughs> it's got it's got to be a budget choice, right? Like, uh-huh. it's, yeah, but anyway. Anyway, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely spent 90 minutes in worse ways. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> There's a silver lining. I try to keep on keeping on. 